Okay. In case anybody didn't hear this, if you downloaded the slides before, right now, uh, you need to re-download them. I caught an error a few minutes ago. Uh, so the corrected slides are now the ones listed in Canvas. So go ahead and re-download those if you downloaded them before today. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully everyone had a fantastic weekend. Uh, today we're going to be switching gears into the second part of calculus. Calculus is in split into two parts. We have differential calculus, which is what we've been talking about up until uh, last week. Today we're going to get into integral calculus. Okay. Uh, so differentiation and integration are opposites of each other. So we're going to start talking about the opposite of taking the derivative. All right. So some announcements. Uh, first off, you have homework due tonight. There's a big curve sketching, two big curve sketching problems. Use uh, resources that are available to you. Use Desmos to check your uh, work. That's, that's fine with me. I'm fine with you checking your work, especially on problems like those that are more involved, that do have more complicated algebra uh, in the first and second derivatives. Definitely use Desmos to check your answer. Uh, don't just copy the graph from Desmos, OK? Mm -hmm. But as long as you're following all the steps that I listed in the slides from curve sketching, uh, you'll be fine. Okay, so homework due tonight. Uh, there's new homework posted in Canvas uh, over what we're learning this week. <clears throat> okay, and we're not meeting synchronously tomorrow. I'm just going to post a video about Newton's method and another uh, video over area. Okay, so do not try to Zoom call me at eight o'clock tomorrow. I will not be available. I will be voting, okay? You all should vote if you haven't voted yet, if you're able to, okay? So, <clears throat> uh, but keep your eyes peeled for a video tomorrow, all right? And then there was, excellent. Yes, if you've voted, then that's great. Uh, then also, I wanted to mention this Newton's method. Um, I'm going to post a video about it. I'm not going to test you over it. It's not anything that you need to know. It's just, again, one of my favorite applications of the derivative. If you're a math major, which everybody should be math majors, math majors are the best majors. Then if you take numerical analysis, which is the class I'm teaching this semester, it's actually what we start the class off with. So if you want to get a little bit of a taste of What's some uh, cool things you can do with math? Newton's method is a, is a good example. So again, not going to be tested over it, but just so you know, um, it's cool. That's why I'm making a video about it. Uh, will the video be posted by normal class time? I believe so. I'm going to try and post everything tonight. If not, then um, sorry. But I, I'm, it's probably going to be posted by normal class time. All right. Any other questions about anything? Cool. All right. So first, I'm going to try and motivate what's called the antiderivative. OK, so like I said, we've spent all semester building up this derivative, taking the derivative, using the derivative to do things uh, find out what the shape of a graph looks like. Well, now we're going to undo all of our hard work. Okay, so we know that if we have a position function, which is usually called S of T, uh, that describes distance traveled as a function of time, then the velocity uh, is just the derivative with respect to time, right? The velocity v of t is s prime of t, the derivative with respect to t. And further, we can say the acceleration is the derivative of velocity, right? That's also the derivative with respect to time. Okay. But in physics, there's a very important equation called Newton's uh, second law 
that says uh, the force applied to an object is equal to its mass times ex uh, uh, its acceleration. So in physics, anytime something is moving, almost anytime something is moving, you're starting off with this equation to look at how is it moving. Okay, so in physics, you actually most of the time start with acceleration instead of starting with position. So the question is, well, if I start with acceleration, could I figure out position? Because just having acceleration isn't that useful. I want to know, I want to know the curve that tells me the position of some something, right? And the answer is yes. Okay, so for example, a falling object experiences acceleration. Uh, only due to the force of gravity. Okay, that's not true actually, but we're going to assume uh, the only forces applied to this falling object are due to gravity. Um, if it's out in the wind, then obviously there's a drag force, but pretend that doesn't exist. All right, so the acceleration of this object is just a of t equals negative 9.8, and the new units on this for anyone who cares are meters per second squared, okay? The acceleration of anything that's falling is negative 9.8 meters per second squared, okay? If I jump, my acceleration was negative 9.8 meters per second squared, okay? The whole time, the whole time. So using that, let's say I throw a ball into the air at 30 miles an hour from the ground, so from S equals zero. Can we find the distance function S of T that tells me the distance that the ball has traveled in the air after T seconds? And the answer is yes. Okay, so let's start with, we're gonna start with A of T, A of T is equal to negative 9.8. All right, so going straight from acceleration to position, that's a pretty big jump. Let's first, how we know uh, acceleration is related to velocity, right? Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So that means acceleration is the derivative of velocity, right? That means V prime of T is equal to negative, sorry, negative 9.8. What function do you guys know that when you take its derivative, you just get a constant? This isn't take the derivative and plug in the number. This is take the derivative of a function and you just get a constant number. What do we think? Have it in the chat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is, uh, think of a, a constant, or it's not constant, a, a linear function, right? Any function that looks like uh, m times t plus b, when I take the derivative, I'm just going to be left with v prime of t is equal to m, right? Does that make sense? So because I take the derivative of a function and I get a constant, the function that I took the derivative of had to be a linear function. It had to be m times t plus b, okay? And what does m have to be? When I take the derivative- Negative 9.8. Yeah, very good. Negative 9.8. When I take the derivative, I have to get negative 9.8, no matter what t is, okay? That's exactly what happens with a straight line. With a straight line, no matter where you are on the line, the slope is always the same, right? So now I've got this b in here. How can I figure out what b is? Can you add 30 to the equation? Why would I add 30 to the equation? 
first of all, yes, I can. If, if I add anything to this, then when I take the derivative, I still just get negative 9.8. But why would it, why would B be 30? So let's say I throw the ball into the air at 30 meters per second from the ground. So I throw the ball into the air at 30 meters per second. That's, well, 30 meters per second is a velocity, right? And that's velocity when T equals, this is when the whole thing is starting. So T equals zero, very good. So when T equals zero, when T is zero, I know that I have to get 30 meters per second. But also when t equals zero, well, if I plug in t equals zero into v of t, the negative 9.8 t, well, that's just gonna be zero when I plug in zero. So I'm just gonna get b, okay? So b is equal to 30, so that v of t is negative 9.8 times t plus 30. Now, I have velocity. How is velocity related to position? It's the derivative of it with respect to time. So we know that S prime of T, S prime of T is equal to negative 9.8 times T plus 30. All right, so S of T. All right, let's take this piece by piece. First of all, the 30. Well, again, that's just a constant number. So I took the derivative of something and I got, for, for this piece, let's just look at the 30, I got 30. So what did that have to come from? Yeah, well, we're using t's, but yeah, exactly. So this is gonna give me a 30 t plus some constant, right? I can also differentiate constants and still get zero, okay? All right, and then we'll look at this slightly more difficult one. I took a derivative of something and I got negative 9.8 times t to the first. What functions do you know that when you take their derivative, you get a t to the first out of them? Squared. Yeah, exactly. Think of the power rule. When I take a squared function, I take its derivative, then I'm going to subtract one off the exponent. I'm going to end up with uh, just a t. So it's going to be t squared, and we're going to find out where this number I'm about to write down comes from. It's really negative 4.9 t squared. Negative 4.9, what is that? Well, that's negative 9.8 divided by two. Now, when I take the derivative of this, I end up with exactly what I want for the velocity, right? So then I can find the, the other thing, piece of information we know is I say I throw the ball initially from the ground. So I'm starting down here and I do a is the old toss it up in the air and catch it thing, you know? So that means that S of zero is what? C. S of zero is C, yes. But what else is S of zero? If I start with the ball on the ground and then launch it up. When the ball's on the ground, what position do we want to call that? If this is six feet, what is that? Zero, right? When the ball's on the ground, we say that that's zero. So initially, I'm throwing the ball from the ground, throw it up into the air, 
And then, uh, I mean, that's uh, just starting from the ground is starting at zero, right? So that means C is equal to zero. Very good. Yes, thank you, everybody in the chat. All right, so that means S as a function of T is equal to negative 4.9 T squared plus 30 T. And this is real. This is what physicists really, it's their real first approximation for how things fly through the air. This is called projectile motion. And this is, if you go into a physics class, uh, this, this is the same equation that they will give you. And sometimes they'll just say, here, remember this equation. Now you guys know, you guys know where this comes from. It comes from, you look at acceleration, that has to come from velocity. And so if acceleration is constant, then velocity is linear. But then if velocity is linear, then position is quadratic. And that's all it is. It's just thinking a little bit about how do I undo derivatives? Okay, so this is the whole motivation behind um, undoing derivatives, okay? <clears throat> um, uh, it pretty clearly is important to be able to undifferentiate something um, <clears throat> because this very simple application, uh, I mean, again, it's very simple, but it's also pretty realistic. It tells you how a uh, cannonball will fly through the air, for instance, or a rocket will will shoot up into the air if you know how much uh, fuel it has, okay? So the process of undoing the derivative is called anti-differentiation, which is a good scrabble word, uh, or indefinite integration, okay? So um, the, these two words are synonyms, okay? They mean the exact same thing, anti-differentiation, and indefinite integration. So I'm going to give you a rigorous definition of an antiderivative of f. Notice this is an and not the. It's not the uh, antiderivative. Kevin Matheson, you're still zoomed in. I'm still zoomed in. Wait. Can you not, what page does it look like I'm on? You're fine for me. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. So let's give a rigorous definition of an antiderivative, okay? So a function, and this is very standard, the, you call the antiderivative, or sorry, an antiderivative uh, of the function little f, you call an antiderivative of it capital F, okay? So a function capital F is an antiderivative of little f on the interval i when capital F prime of x is equal to little f of x for all x in the interval i. Okay, so this means if I make a claim, if I make the claim that say, uh, I don't know, an antiderivative of x squared, an antiderivative is x cubed. You can very easily check me and tell me I'm wrong. And how would you check me? If I say, an antiderivative an antiderivative of x squared is x cubed then how would you tell me that i'm wrong or what would you do to show me i'm wrong <clears throat> yeah exactly i i'm going to take instead of trying to find Instead of you going through and trying to find an antiderivative of x squared and making sure it matches up with mine, no, if I make a claim that something is an antiderivative, you can just differentiate this. You just differentiate the thing that I say is an antiderivative. Because differentiation is way easier than undoing it differentiation, right? 
So if I differentiate x cubed, I get 3x squared, which is not the same thing as x squared. Okay, and that's enough to show me that x cubed is not an antiderivative of x squared. Okay, so if, if ever if there's a question on the homework, it's like the last question, I think, uh, of the first section. There's a question that says, uh, verify that such and such is an antiderivative of another function. You just differentiate the thing that they're making the claim about. Okay. So, any questions so far? Okay. So, oh. <laughs> find an antiderivative of 3x squared. All right. X to the third. Yeah, I, I gave away uh, gave away the surprise there. Uh, f of x, let's claim that f of x equals x to the third is an antiderivative. Well, how do we check this? Take the derivative. Yeah, I'm going to take the derivative. F prime of x is 3x squared by the power rule, but then that is just little f of x, right? Very good. What if I had said capital F is x cubed plus 27? Is that also an antiderivative? It would still be the same. Yeah, when I take the derivative, I still get 3x squared. Okay, this is why we say an antiderivative instead of the antiderivative, because I can add any constant here. I could have added, added 270. I could have added, uh, I don't know, pi times or 2, 2 pi, right? I could have added anything. So I'll just put a C for a constant. Okay. I could have added any constant thing and it's still an antiderivative. Very good. Find an antiderivative of the function f of x equals e to the x. Well, what function do we know that when we take its derivative, we get e to the x? Very good. Two chats that say f of x, capital F of x is equal to e to the x. Very good. And how do we check that this is an antiderivative? Well, I take the derivative of the thing that I say is an antiderivative, and I should get the original function back. Okay. And so capital F prime of x, well, e to the x is that special function that when I differentiate it, I get e to the x back. And that's little f of x. Okay. Notice that also e to the x plus 1 over 200,001 uh, is an antiderivative. Again, you can add any constant to, the, to an antiderivative you find, and it's still an antiderivative. Okay. That constant is going to be important in a second. Any questions on this? Should we always add the plus C? Uh, it depends on the context, but you, we're, yes, the answer is going to be yes. You're going to add, you're going to always add some constant. So it's like I planted you in the audience. Let's look at the next theorem. This, this theorem is going to tell us what all antiderivatives look like, okay? So if capital F is an antiderivative of little f on an interval i, then capital G is an antiderivative of little f on the interval i if and only if capital G of x is equal to capital F of x plus C 
for all x in the interval i, where c is a constant. Okay? This c is called the constant of integration. And again, it's very, very important. So a proof of this, well, again, anytime I say if and only if, that means I actually need to prove two things. I need to first prove that if G is an antiderivative of F, then G of X looks like F of X plus, capital F of X plus C, okay? So first, first, Assume G, well, what does it mean for capital G to be an antiderivative of little f? No, it's okay, I thought so. <laughs> well, what does it mean for capital G to be an antiderivative of little f. Perfect. That means g prime equals little f. So first we're going to assume this. Okay. Then I'm going to look at the function capital G of x minus capital F of X. I'm going to look at that function and I'm going to take its derivative. Okay. Well, again, with the, the derivative of a sum or a difference is just the sum or difference of the derivatives. So what's the derivative of capital G of X? The derivative of capital G. Little f of x? Yeah, that's little f of x, right? Because capital G is an antiderivative of little f. Minus, what's the derivative of capital F of x? <clears throat> well, remember, f is also an antiderivative of f. So what's the derivative of capital F? That's also little f. So I'm going to get little f minus little f. But what's little f of x minus little f of x? Zero. Zero, right? That's equal to zero. So I took the derivative of a function and I got zero everywhere. So this function, I'm getting zero everywhere for the derivative. So what does that tell me about the original function that I took the derivative of? Yeah, thank you, Saba. It's a, it's a constant. And we proved this at the very, if you remember the mean value theorem lesson, like the very end of class, we proved that a function that is that has a zero derivative on an interval, it has to be constant on that interval. Okay, so that means we have g of x minus f of x prime equals zero for all x in i, for all x in the interval i. So g of x minus f of x is equal to some constant, some constant number C. And so then, so G of X is equal to F of X plus some C. So that was the hard direction. If we assume, on the other hand, if we assume 
if we instead assume just that G capital G of X is equal to capital F of X plus C, but I don't assume anything about G of X being an antiderivative. Well, then how can I show if capital G is equal to capital F plus C, how can I show that capital G of X is an antiderivative of little f? Just work the first proof backwards. Uh, I could, I, I, I don't even need to do that much really. I, I need to show, what do I need to show to show that G is an antiderivative of F, of little f? Yeah, yeah, I just need to show G prime. I could work the first proof backwards. That's more work than I need to do. I could just show G prime. I need to show G, capital G prime is little f, right? But I know capital G prime is capital F of X plus C prime. But that's just equal to capital F of X prime because C is a constant. And then we know we're given that capital F is an antiderivative. So this is definitely equal to little f of that. Okay. And so that tells us that if G, capital G is capital F plus C, then capital G is also an antiderivative. Okay. So this means that all antiderivatives of a function look like some, an antiderivative plus a constant. So your goal in finding antiderivatives is always find one that works and then you can just add a constant C to it. Okay. Questions on that? I feel the question coming. Do we need to know this proof for the exam? No, you do not. You just need to know how to find antiderivatives um, for any upcoming exams. Okay. So, that leads us to differential equations. No, we're not actually going to solve real differential equations, but uh, an equation that involves any function y and one or more of its derivatives is called a differential equation. Okay. Differential equations in general are like antiderivative problems, but they can be even harder. Okay. We're only going to solve differential equations that look like this like the ones that we've started off with, like acceleration equals something, uh, 9.8. Uh, here's one, y prime equals x squared. So what function do you know that when you take the derivative of it, you get just x squared? The constant is is weird. What what's just the the exponent part gonna be? Yeah, I'm definitely gonna get an oops. Uh oh, that was close. I'm definitely gonna get an x cubed, right? Because when I differentiate x cubed, I get three. I get the x squared is right, but this three out in front is bad. So what should I do with what should I divide this function by? It should be one third x cubed. Good. I should divide that by three to get rid of the three that's going to come out in front when I differentiate. Okay, so I'm going to get one third x cubed. That's an antiderivative. And then now to find all antiderivatives, what do I do? I, I add c. Very good. Very good. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay, so the family of functions x cubed over three plus c is just called the general antiderivative of x squared, or as we're gonna see in a second, it's called the indefinite integral of x squared, okay? 
So writing out, find all antiderivatives of a function f of x, or saying like, I have I found all antiderivatives of f of x, and it is this. Uh, instead, we're just going to use some notation to write that in a simpler way. So uh, this notation here on the left, this is notation. This notation says find all antiderivatives of little f of x. Okay, so this sign right here is called an integral sign. Integral sign. The function inside the integral is called the integrand. And then this dx here, maybe I shouldn't use, if anyone's red, green, colorblind, I should use something else. Uh, this dx here is, the, the d doesn't really matter. This is really telling you what variable you need to differentiate with respect to, okay? Variable of integration. Okay. So on your homework, there are a few problems that I assigned to you where it's the integral of f of y, dy. Well, I mean, it plays the same role as x. But you do need, if it asks for an integral in terms of y, you need to give your answer in terms of y. Okay. So the integral, the indefinite integral of f of x with respect to x. Again, that's just shorthand for saying find all antiderivatives of little f. So your answer should always, if you're doing an, an integral problem, your answer, well, an indefinite integral problem, your answer should always involve that plus c. Okay. If you don't add c uh, on an exam, it's going to be wrong. Sorry. Um, but I wanted all antiderivatives, and you only gave me one. There's infinitely many. Okay. So make sure you add the C. Later, I'm going to tell an awful joke. Fair warning. So, <clears throat> yeah, come on. So the process of finding all antiderivatives of a function is called indefinite integration, or I might just say integration for short. Okay. But again, technically, this is called the indefinite integral. Later, we're going to learn about what's called the definite integral. Okay. It involves the indefinite integral. All right, so find the indefinite integral of x squared minus 1 over x squared with respect to x. Okay. So. We'll do this piece by piece, and we're going to see in a second why we're allowed to do that, but we'll do this piece by piece, okay? So what function do I need to differentiate to get x squared? We actually just did this one. One third x cubed plus c. Yeah, very good. One third x cubed plus c. I'm going to write my plus c over here because I also need to integrate minus one over x squared. Well, let me rewrite this as x to the two minus x to the minus two dx. Okay. So what function do you know that when you differentiate it, you get x to the minus two? It would be the same, but with a negative three. Uh, careful. I would. I would say not negative three. You're on the right track. Yes, perfect. I would add you to go backwards with the power rule. Instead of subtracting one, I add one. Right. So I'm going to add one to the exponent, which is negative two. 
I'm going to get <clears throat> uh, uh, x to the negative 1. And then should this be plus or minus out here? Minus. Let's see. If it's a minus, well, then when I differentiate this, I'm going to get x. Well, I'll get 3x squared over 3 minus minus x to the minus 2 plus c. And that will give me x squared plus x to the minus 2 plus, or sorry, not plus c. If I differentiate, I'm just left with that. So if I put a mi or if I put a minus out there, then when I differentiate, I get x squared plus x to the minus 2. So then what I actually need here is a plus. And then I'll end up with x squared minus x to the minus 2, like I want. Okay. So what we're doing here is called the power rule for integration. And let me write it down for you in general, or we'll work it out in general. Let's say I want to find the integral of x to the n dx. Well, what is this equal to? Well, first of all, what function did I have to differentiate to get to x to the n? Very good. Thank you, Saba. It's x to the n plus 1, right? Now, when I differentiate x to the n plus 1, I'm going to have a, a factor out here, right? So what do I get when I differentiate x to the n plus 1? Power rule tells me I'm going to get what? Yeah, very good. So then, because when I differentiate x to the n plus 1, I get n plus 1 times x to the n. Well, if I want the uh, indefinite integral of x to the n, well, that's going to be x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1, right? And that way, that way I'll get cancellation from those guys and just be left with x to the n. This is true for all n except for what? Is there an n that you can see here that's going to give us any trouble? Zero. Uh, negative one, right? When the net, yeah, when the denominator is zero, which is when n is negative one, right? So this doesn't hold for n equals negative one. Okay, but we actually do know. We actually do know what happens when n is negative one, right? Because what function? Oh, you know what I forgot to do? You know what I forgot to do up here? There we go. What function do I need to differentiate to get 1 over x? Who remembers? It's not just the power of x. Oh, yeah, very good. The natural log of x, right? And technically, I'm going to put here absolute values. You can for, forget about those for now, but that's fine. Okay. So these rules really all come from are rules that we have for differentiation, right? Every rule that we have for differentiating a function, if you just integrate it, well, then you have a new rule for integration. Okay. So uh, there's a table in your book. 
on page uh, 246, uh, that's going to be very, very useful on the homework. Use the table. Don't, I mean, working some of these out on, on your own is definitely useful, but using the table is also very useful. Integration in general is a hard problem once you start looking at just big general functions. Okay, so integration by table is actually a thing that people say. So don't be ashamed to use a table. It's going to be very useful. We're going to work out some of these rules on our own. But all these integration formulas on the right really just come from integrating the differentiation rules on the left. Okay. So that's that. This table, again, it's in your notes now. You can use the notes. It's also on page 246 in your book. It's going to be very useful for the homework. Okay. One of the most important rules is, really two of the most important rules are this one and this one, the integral of a sum. Well, because the derivative of a sum is just the sum of the derivatives, by the same token, the integral of a sum is just the sum of the integrals. Okay. And again, for the same reason, when I differentiate a constant times a function, I just get that constant times the derivative of the function. Integration works the same way. When you integrate a constant times a function, you just get that constant times the integral of the function. Okay. So with integration, just like with differentiation, if you're integrating a big sum, you can do it piece by piece. You don't have to try and do it all at once. Any other, the other rule, so those two rules and obviously this rule are going to be hugely important for us. We, we mostly work with polynomials and stuff. So notice uh, two rules, three rules that you know for differentiation that are absent from this table. What rules are those that are absent from this table? Product rule, very good. Product rule, we will learn if you take calc two, we're going to learn how to undo the product rule. Okay. And it's what's called integration by parts. Uh, quotient rule doesn't really have quotient rule because the quotient rule is, you can think of it as the product rule and the chain rule. The quotient rule doesn't really have a, a counterpart. Okay. And one other rule is missing. What was it? Chain. Chain rule, chain. exactly. The opposite of the chain rule, and we're going to learn this by the end of the semester, the opposite of the chain rule is what's called a U substitution. And we're going to cover that by the end of the semester. Okay. So. Two other rules that aren't in the table. Uh, we have the integral of E, oh gosh, I knew that I was gonna mess it up. The integral of E to the X is E to the X plus C, and the integral of one over X is obviously not just one over X. Sorry about that. It's the natural log of X plus C. These aren't in the table in your book because your book covers exponential and logarithmic functions so late in the book which is so weird. Okay. Questions on these. So e to the x is everybody's favorite function because when you differentiate it, you just get e to the x. And when you integrate it, you just get e to the x. There's no games with e to the x. So great. OK. So um, I will, we still got a lot. I'm going to do the second half of these notes tomorrow, I will post as a video. Okay, so tomorrow, expect the second half of these notes on Canvas, which is just mostly going to be me working out problems. And then also expect a video on uh, Newton's method. It's going to be very short. It's just going to be look at what you can do with derivatives. Okay, so if anybody has any questions, please feel free to stick around and ask me. Uh, otherwise, please just wipe down your desks as you go. Do we're not meeting tomorrow. Asynchronous, okay? So, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.